undocumented event that was concocted by Zionist Jews to justify the creation of the state of Israel, a kind of wave of pity that the world responded to in 1948, three years later. So it was, it was especially important for us to go with authentic Muslim leaders in countries like Saudi Arabia, where they had absorbed this kind of narrative perhaps for all their lives. And I, I, I still kind of, I, I still have goosebumps thinking about the moment we met just in front of the that infamous gate, which many of you have seen pictures of, Arbeit macht frei, the German words, work will set you free. One of the ultimate tragic ironies, work, as if Auschwitz were a um, simply a work site, liberating work site. 1.1 million people were killed, it's estimated, in Auschwitz, of whom close to 1 million were Jews. Among the non-Jews uh, were many um, Catholic clergy, among others. And I saw, because I walked with Mohammed al Isa, the head of the Muslim World League, appointed by the king of Saudi Arabia, the custodian of the two holy mosques. And, I, and, and we came to a pavilion. Mm. I don't know if I can get through the story um, without emotion. How many of you have been to Auschwitz? Six or seven people. I hope you'll have an opportunity at some point in your life. And we stood in front of one of the exhibits, which was of children's shoes that had been collected. Piles of children's shoes. And Dr. Alisa was staring. And all of a sudden, he took my left hand. He was standing on, on my left. And with his right hand, he took my left hand and he started squeezing it. And I could feel the trembling through his arm into my hand. He, he couldn't let go because he saw in those children's shoes children. And he understood, we talked about it later, the kind of bestiality by humans by humans that would kill children, six months old, a year old, two years old, three years old, children, his children's age, my grandchildren's age, for one reason only, they were born Jewish. And then we went to the exhibit of suitcases. The Jews from Vienna and Prague and Budapest and Bucharest and Berlin and Frankfurt and elsewhere who thought they were going to a work camp and they brought those suitcases. Um, and then the next, the eyeglasses. And then the hair. Pounds and pounds and pounds of hair, human hair. And he understood. This was not some Steven Spielberg concoction designed to fool the world into creating some sympathy for the Jews. This was real. And he, as a man of faith, had to understand it. Not just because the, 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 the targets were principally Jews, but because this was an illustration of man's capacity for inhumanity an impulse that could be inside many of us. Unless we find the ways through faith, through religion, through liberal democracy, um, through, through family, to contain it. These were educated people who did the killing. They went home at night. They had dinner with their wives and their children. They played with their children. They sent their children to school the next day. And then they went back to kill other children who would be denied school and denied parents' time and denied toys because they were Jews. He understood it. And we 
bonded there in a way that I think will seal us together for life. And we want to go to Srebrenica. We wanted to see how Muslim men and boys were murdered, thousands, an estimated 9,000, uh, by Slobodan Milosevic uh, and by his, his own ethnic cleansing against Muslims, Muslims in Bosnia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, later in, in Kosovo. We have to understand each other's fundamental pain and trauma. And, and through that, create the human empathy that again returns us to the path of what all our faiths teach us as the most noble virtues and values. Because if not, Srebrenica came 40 years after the Shoah. So what exactly do the words never again mean? And if, if, if it's not up to us, then who? Who's the other? If it's not up to the Islamic Center of Cincinnati and Xavier University and Thomas More University and the American Jewish Committee and the other institutions represented here, who else is there? And that's my answer. So each and every one of us, absolutely. And you know, your story is very powerful because um, you feel the humanity that was uh, recognized. You feel the pain of the other that was recognized. So each of us must remember that, you know, in order for people to understand our pain, it is so important to understand the plight and the pain of other people across the globe or whether they be our neighbors. I just returned from Sarajevo. So your story, I, didn't um, I just. This was unscripted. Less, less than a few weeks. And so. You know, we cannot be at those places. One of the most powerful experiences I heard was from uh, Imam Majid when he went to Auschwitz. But at the same time, he, he was in our delegation. He was this one as well. And it was really, uh, I want to remind ourselves before I turn it to, uh, to James is that, you know, we have an opportunity. Uh, Islamophobia, anti Semitism was fever pitch. Um, uh, in 2015, and it was really um, Kathy and Michelle Young, Kathy Elfman and Michelle Young and others who approached me in terms of getting women together for speaking up against, you know, the hate against any one of us. And so it was Catholic women, Jewish women, Sikh women, um, you know, Muslim women uh, from all throughout the region, and we had to fire a bus from the Islamic Center of Greater Cincinnati to convene downtown at the at, uh, Fountain Square. And so, you know, we have opportunities, I guess, every day in order to feel each other's humanity and to understand. And sometimes the, the pain is far away, but I would just ask us to always, always remember that, you know, um, it, we must recognize others' humanity and others' pains. One, one of the things that David does in, um, is he does regular briefings about what's going on in the world. You can see them on YouTube, in fact, if you're there. And one of the topics that is, is thematically runs through many of those great briefings is, is what we would have to refer to as the 800-pound gorilla in every room, which is and as somebody who's been to Israel a couple of dozen times in my lifetime, and, and seeing stops and starts and what goes on there, and I've been there with CLI, I've done work with Sean Hartman, I've met with the leaders, I've met with military leaders, and I'm increasingly bleak about it. In fact, one of the terms that I often use in describing it is that it seems intractable. Um, how, how, do you, how do you deal with this? It, it's, it's such a huge issue among jewelry everywhere. But, uh, in, in American jewelry, it's, it's just such a massive 
topic, and particularly the, the young Jews that, that I know have such a difficulty dealing with it. Do you, where do you find hope, and, and how do we find hope in, in looking at that situation? I'm taking off my jacket and rolling up my sleeves since I'm just getting started, so <laughs> I don't know what your plans are for the evening. <laughs> Kathy, I think our next meeting is not until tomorrow morning. <laughs> so, um, don't get scared if you need to leave. Um, James, I have to tell you uh, with great respect, I don't share your sense of bleakness. Not at all. Um, maybe I draw my inspiration from Israel's national anthem, which is called Hatikva. Atikva means the hope. Um, the words liyot an chofshi they are saying no to be a free people in our own land. I derive hope from the hope that Israel was meant to express. I derive hope from the fact that this is a unique journey in the annals of history, I believe. As others have said, there may not be another people on the planet, James, who 3,000 years later speak the same language, practice the same faith, and associate with the same piece of land as this story. Psalm 137. How many years ago was Psalm 137 written? More than a few. 2000, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat, yea, we wept, when we remembered Zion. That's a psalm that was written thousands of years ago. By the way, for those of you of roughly my age, um, you may have first encountered it as a song, a, 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 a rock and roll song. Anyone remember who sang it? The, the birds? Uh, anyway, this is quite an extraordinary story, and those people who simply want to reduce it to, you know, Jews are interlopers, crusaders, uh, 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 occupiers, uh, completely fail to understand uh, the scope of the story. Now, I'm not here, James, to defend each and every action of each and every Israeli government any more than I could or would defend each and every action of each and every American government? How could I? Uh, especially given the, the pendulum swing in this country. Um, but as a Jew, I celebrate Israel's rebirth. I find extraordinary inspiration in Israel's rebirth. Um, and I also, as a practical matter, James, know that had there been an Israeli flag flying in 1938 rather than 1948, potentially millions of Jews in Europe would have been saved when, let's say it bluntly, the vast majority of countries in this world, including this good country, closed its borders to Jews. Canada. The United States, Australia, the bulk of Latin American countries, the bulk of neutral countries in Europe, largely closed their gates to Jews like my parents who were trapped. Had Israel existed in 1938, James? The story could have been different. But there's more reason for hope. Today, there are six Arab countries at peace with Israel. We're a patient people. It's a wonderful word in Hebrew, sablanut, patience. We waited a few thousand years. We're still waiting for the Mashiach, our Mashiach. Even as he tarries, as, as, as we say in, in, in our liturgy. Um, six Arab countries, Egypt, Jordan, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco, and I would add 
two or three Arab countries that are not quite at that threshold, but are fully engaged with Israel and figuring out their own timing about when to come forward. And you know why? Not necessarily because they've suddenly overnight become uh, card-carrying AJC members, but because they hear the Minister of Economy of the UAE, who said the other day, you may have seen it, we expect bilateral trade and commerce between Israel and the UAE alone in the next decade to reach one trillion dollars with a T, with a T. What are they missing out on? You know what that trade includes? It includes trade like uh, Israeli war management techniques. It was earlier predicted, James, that Israel would run out of water and its people could not survive. It would uh, not be able to feed itself as its population grew. Israel today is a net exporter of water and it still has the same arid climate that it did in 1948. If anything, the climate is worse because of climate change for all of us. It's exporting water, it's taking water out of the air. And Arab countries and others want access to that kind of knowledge because war could one day become a reason, for, water could one day become a reason for war in the 21st century. How about food production? How about public health? How about cybersecurity, national resilience? There's a lot that Israel has to offer. And these endless cycles of war have brought what? Misery. So I believe that the six will become seven and will become eight. And I believe that one day there will be a resolution of the Palestinian Israeli issue. I'm not normally Pollyannish. I'm not sort of giving in to the happy Hollywood endings that I was raised with. That would be nice. But Anwar Sadat, bless his memory, understood by 1977 that what was more important was building Egypt's future than trying to destroy Israel's. And he made a historic decision. And then came King Hussein, and now the four others. And meanwhile, we hear all this talk about you know, Israel engaged with other Arab countries, named or unnamed. And the Palestinians and the Israelis are destined to live west of the Jordan River. You can change many things in life, you can't change geography. Neither is going away. And one day there will be enough common sense to understand that no, I will never get all that I want and think is my right, but I've got to compromise because a half a loaf is better than no loaf on both sides. So, James, with great respect, I'm not succumbing to bleakness. Um, and if, if we don't fully succeed, then the peacemaking baton is being handed as well. <clears throat> Keep going. Uh, the team AJC. Keep going. Obviously, this is one we could go on for days. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Kiva. Oh, we want to allow some time for, for questions uh, from the audience. And I, I you know, I, <clears throat> I really do appreciate your optimism. I think uh, for that optimism to permeate, I think I want to go back that we have to recognize the pain and suffering of every people and that, you know, uh, the resolutions need to keep those in mind and I pray that that is what happens because I just want to share an article I just read today um, that Engage, Engage um, and MPAC did a survey of Muslims and you know uh, very much top four on their minds were the Palestinian, the Uyghurs in China and the Rohingyas in Burma and uh, you know the humanity of those individuals at the same time they're really concerned about addressing the the plight of uh, Muslim-majority countries, of minorities and civilians, in particular countries such as Syria. So that humanity must be recognized in all aspects of those conflicts that, you know, that we're dealing with. And in order for anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and hate violence to, you know, to, to not permeate and rule our lives, 
Um, I just want you to maybe take a few minutes to just, I know you're very interested in um, drawing lessons from history and how it is that um, we could learn in order to really recognize, you know, everyone's humanity and move towards the, the peace and coexistence that I think this institution and you've just expressed are um, very much believers of. Well, allow me to be a bit provocative. It's your mic. <laughs> I'm a guest. You mentioned the Rohingya. Um, as we meet, there are what? Perhaps a million Rohingya who have been expelled from Myanmar. Um, and not necessarily all hospitably welcomed in neighboring countries. Well, let's go further. A million or more Uyghurs that um, we're told in language that is chillingly evocative of an earlier era are being placed in camps for re-education purposes. That doesn't sound like Camp Hiawatha to me, or whatever the fun summer camps might be called in this part of the country. Um, so where are we? And I have to add, Shakila, the majority of Muslim countries are absolutely silent about the Uyghurs. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. They are absolutely silent. How do we know? Because we spend our time at AJC in the United Nations, in the United Nations Human Rights Council, in the Third Committee, in those places where where, where diplomats and politicians meet and um, engage in lots of talk, more talk than action sometimes, and also too often engage in a kind of glaring examples of total hypocrisy. So I don't doubt the surveys, but I doubt the commitment of their leaders in the, in, in the countries, because look up close. Where are the Muslim-majority countries that should be leading the effort in the United Nations and in the United Nations Human Rights Council and on social media and in the streets and in front of the Chinese embassy in Washington? Where are they? Well, the answer too often is, and this is one of the lessons of history, that they're too busy placating China because they have other fish to fry with China. They want contracts, they want deals, they want votes, they want whatever it is they want. So when, when values, in this case, the value of human life, get sacrificed on the altar of political expediency, then who's left to speak? So, you know, we Jews have heard the words never again, never again, and we want to believe. But as, as we speak, we are told, and we have engaged with the World Uyghur Congress. We have been told that some Muslims are being sterilized. Again, I can't verify because we, but we're being told women are being sterilized, why? So they cannot have Muslim children? They're being re-educated? We, we know what that means. Um, an attempt to deny them their faith and their religion through threat, intimidation, torture, imprisonment, what? So where are we all? Um, and I have to say, the lesson I learned, the central lesson was in our taking on the Soviet Union. Now one can argue the Soviet Union is not China. No, it's not. China is a much more formidable challenge even than the Soviet Union was, but who knew that in the 70s? In the 70s, it looked pretty formidable. And for those of you who are willing to admit that you're my age, you might remember a day in the fall of 1962 
I remember taking the public bus uh, in New York City where I lived, going to school. I was 13 years old, and I authentically believed it was my last day on Earth, that there was going to be a nuclear war between Moscow and Washington over Cuba. And now I have to laugh because we had all these civil defense preparations. And the civil defense preparations in our school for nuclear war, where they took us all to the gym and they told us to face the wall. And that was somehow going to save us. Um, <laughs> well, um, you know, we, Sister Ann Gillen and Sister Rose Ferry and Father Robert Dryman and, and we, AJC, and others who were involved in the Soviet Jewry struggle, were seen as a pain in the tush by an awful lot of politicians in Washington, in London, and elsewhere. You're getting in the way. We have bigger issues to deal with. We have to manage conflicts. We have to manage competition. And don't, don't insert yourselves. Leave it to us. And we said, hell no. We're not leaving it to you. And we're going to continue to be um, that pain in the tush. In Yiddish, we say tofus, but it refers to tush, backside. You know what? John Lewis, the late congressman, said there's such a thing as good trouble. Good trouble. The central lesson I learned from my history is, damn it, make good trouble. Uh, uh. Trying to save human lives is good trouble. Trying to defend people's right to their own faith is good trouble. Standing up to the bullies is good trouble. It's not always pleasant. It's not always easy. It doesn't bring instant gratification necessarily. But you know what? When I was detained in 1974, I could never have imagined that 17 years later, there would be no more Soviet Union. One of the favorite words in my vocabulary today is the word former in front of the word Soviet Union. Former Soviet Union. Wishy Sadetsky Soyuz. And I would never have imagined in, in a country in which the word emigration did not exist. Don't think America or Canada. The word emigratia did not exist in the Soviet vocabulary. And close to two million Jews left. They left the workers' paradise. So uh, why am I hopeful, James? Because I've seen hope realized. What's the tactic, Shakila? It's good trouble. It's standing up to the bullies. And it's not allowing um, political expediency to displace human lives and human dignity as the central purpose of our mission in lives. But you pay a price. The price can be detention or arrest. The price can be cancellation of contracts between countries. The price can be, no, we won't vote for your candidate for Secretary General of the UN or the World Health Organization. But you know what? The heck with them. If I have to choose, I'll choose human lives. That's the central lesson of my history. May we all choose to live. And I'm going to clarify, the survey that I was talking about is of uh, Muslim Americans. So it wasn't a global survey. So. Sorry, I didn't understand. No, that's... Uh, but can you still allow me to make a point, which is step up the game on the, on the weakest. And, and everyone, absolutely, need to step, step up, up the game for each other. So step I think up. we're uh, we're short on time, and yeah, so I, our, uh, we're out of time. <laughs> our host is uh, going to questions. Okay. We have two in the back that are going to be collecting a couple of questions. Maybe we can have a few before we finish. But while we're collecting a few, if you have any, raise your hand and they'll get a piece of paper to you so you can write a question. Uh, I have one that I would like to ask David to, to think about. 
in reading the AJC materials, I saw your reference to a quote, which has always been one of my favorites, by John F. Kennedy. <clears throat> goes like this. Too often we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. How relevant is it to recent spikes in anti-Semitism and anti-Asian hate? That's actually the quote on my Twitter account. That's how much I value that, that quote. Here's my big concern and the reason why I thought that was, for me at least, the right quote. I, I believe that too many people in our country have stopped thinking. Um, they've outsourced their thinking. And this is one of the challenges of any great university. We now increasingly as a nation, I believe, are living in our own um, intellectual gated communities. It's no longer just the geographic gated communities in, in wherever it may be, uh, with the guard in the front because we want to live with people like ourselves and whatever, same age or same level of health or whatever the United States. We're living in intellectually gated communities. We've stopped thinking for ourselves. So we're letting, take your pick. We're letting Rachel Maddow think for us. We're letting Tucker Carlson think for us. Um, we're letting Chris Cuomo think for us. We're letting Sean Hannity think for us. Um, we're letting right-wing newspapers think for us. We're letting left-wing newspapers think for us. We're putting on a kind of intellectual uniform every day that says, I am a proud film of life, progressive, liberal, conservative, populist, whatever it may be. And we are then living within the space created within that larger, vast digital place, and we're not moving from it. And I believe that, and it's, it's a larger question even than you ask. I believe that the implications for America, forget the rest of the world, are absolutely frightening. Frightening. I, I spent many years as a debater. If I could construct my own high school, I would make the de debating obligatory. Not an after-school club competing with a league club or soccer or baseball. I'd make it obligatory. Because one of the things that I learned from debating um, was There's a, there's, a, there's, there's a resolution, <clears throat> and sometimes you're asked to debate for, and sometimes you're assigned to debate against. You don't always get to choose. And you do your research, and you discover that on a heck of a lot of issues, which you thought were really black and white, cut and dry, oh my gosh, there actually could be more than one reasonable point of view. I may or may not, at the end of the day, agree with it, but it's not unreasonable. It's not cockamamie. Um, and the more I discovered it, on the one hand, the more confused I became, because what I thought were my own positions on issues were no longer, because, gee, <laughs> um, pick, pick the issue. Um, but also, the more I understood we need more such conversations. We need more people meeting one another in the middle and listening to each other, not by shouting at each other, but by inviting each other into our living room, so to speak. I mean, when I grew up, Gary, you'll, you'll remember this. You know, we used to watch the news. Usually it was a half hour in the evening, too, the national news. Local news was all, you know, blood and sirens and weather and sports. But you had people like uh, Walter Cronkite and Eric Severi and Huntley and Brinkley, names that the older people here will know, but not the others. But you know, I remember my, my parents debating between them 
Are these guys liberals? Are they conservatives? How do, how do you think they vote? And most people never knew. They presented the news as best they could, but without asking you to believe what they believed. You can't watch five minutes of Rachel Maddow or Tucker Carlson without, without knowing what they believe. And the very fact that you're watching them probably predisposes you to want to believe what they say, whether it's accurate or not. I'm not judging. But they can't both be accurate because they're, <laughs> they're polar opposite sides of any issue. So at our dinner table, when the news was over, as I got older, you know, I could join the conversation. Well, gee, hmm, that Vietnam War that they presented, let's talk some more about it. Is it right that we're there? Is it wrong that we're there? Um, that's largely gone, I think. I would bring back debating. I would try and establish rules of civility. I'm scared to death, Mr. President, of those universities that have shut down um, open discussion and debate. When I went to Penn, uh, maybe it was just being provocative, they invited every lunatic on the planet to come and speak. Um, if anyone went to Penn, there was Irvine Auditorium, which was the, the big meeting place. You had, uh, you had Don Birch Society, and you had Black Panthers, and I think there was even at one point a neo-Nazi, and there weren't social workers scattered around the, the room to help the, 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 us children cope with what we were hearing. First of all, we didn't have to go. But secondly, what they were really trying to do, I now understand it, was, was tell us, in the real world, there are lots of people with lots of ideas, some good and some strange, but if you try and hide yourself from them, or shut them down, or keep them out, what do we end up becoming? I'm going to end up living in a geographic, intellectual, um, political, gated community. And what happens then to the social pool of America? Um, it's scary. It's very scary. Good question for you, David. During your 30 years of AJC, what was the most difficult experience you had to face, and how did you overcome it? <laughs> This one can I won't go, go to any of the three. <laughs> How do you confront people of your own faith if they use religion as an excuse to spread hate and violence? Let me take the second one first and buy time on the first one. Um, I, you know, I. I I don't go out looking for fights. Um, but I think when, when, when the core principles and values are, are, are violated, I think, I think we have to stand up and we have to speak out. So I'll give you an example. It's a very painful example. Um, 1995, Yigal Amir, that's his name, he assassinated the prime